Welcome to Making Money Matter, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Kerry Stevenson. And today I have asked Mark Chandler. He's the chief market strategist for, let me get this right, Bannockburn Global Forex over there in New York City. I got it right. Woo-hoo. I was having trouble before, ladies and gentlemen, just before we started recording. I was like, I can't pronounce it. Uh, but Mark <laughs> said, I'm not the only one, but apparently with that thumbs up, I got it right. Now, Mark's been covering global capital markets for over 30 years. Why do I want Mark on? Because he understands a lot about the markets and currency. And I've spoken before with Jim Rickards about currency wars. Mark's very into what's going on in terms of the US dollar. In fact, he wrote a book called Making Sense of the Dollar back in 2009. We'll come to that in a minute. And he's also written a second book in 2017, which is called The Political Economy of Tomorrow. So two books out there. You can find links to both of them on Mark, that's M-A-R-C, marktomarket.com. And Mark also does a blog for free on that website where he'll look at what's going on in the economy, give you macro views, give you some technical analysis, lots of good information. And as I often say to all of you, stop watching Netflix, start getting educated, start listening and learning from people like Mark Chandler. Go to his website. But for now, have a listen to what he's got to say. Welcome to Making Money Matter. Mark, great to see you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Mark, before we start, let me ask you two things. Firstly, a little bit about your background. You're with Bannockburn Global Forex, but not for long. You've worked with HSBC and you've worked with other banks in the past. Just give us a brief overview. Yeah, sure. I feel like accidentally fell into the fell into the markets. I have a uh, uh, long story short. I have a master's degree in American history, and focusing at, at all on the twentieth century brings you into international relations. So I uh, pursued a master's of international relations, and when I got out of school, I was afraid that the only skill I had that someone could think they could make money from me is writing. I wrote for school newspapers, and of course, as a grad student, you'd always write. So I began my career as a journalist on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in 1986, uh, shortly after the Plaza Agreement. The Plaza Agreement in uh, September 1985, the dollar had gotten so strong uh, the G7 countries, the major countries, actually G5 countries, I don't think Italy and Canada were invited then, but... Uh, they, they met at the Plaza Hotel in New York City, which now is condominiums. And uh, anyways, they met and they decided to intervene and drive the dollar down. So my career as a currency journalist uh, began shortly thereafter. Uh, so I was on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange covering for a news warrior. These are the first computers we had. They were commercially, you know, retail computers, which were a radio shack. TRS-80s, which are uh, more like uh, sophisticated word processors, even for that time. And we had a cradle that you had to like hook up the phone into this uh, headset, if you will, uh, to transmit the story. But so I, I began there at the floor uh, covering the currency futures and T-bill euro dollar futures. And I learned that the markets uh, reward people to have an opinion. They don't have to be right, but they have to have an opinion. Sometimes the opinion is so silly, it helps people crystallize their own objections to it and have a greater confidence of the other side of it. So I found that uh, going from a journalist, and that's what, what, what can you imagine a, a, a guy, uh, two master's degrees out of school, if he has anything, it's an opinion. And I found that uh, my first job was at Dean Witter after the news reporter, uh, and I was providing... Uh, advice to retail brokers about the currency futures, which were just drawing a lot of interest as a speculative vehicle. Uh, And that just began a career uh, from uh, analytic companies to uh, brokerage to uh, hedge fund. And my last, uh, the last part of my career has really been at at some of the large banks, uh, uh, Deutsche Bank, HSBC. I spent the last uh, 15 years at Brown Brothers as heading up the currency strategy effort there. I joined Bannockburn, frankly, because I kind of thought I became part of the problem. I kind of thought that the problem that we were having was uh, a profound problem in the United States, but it's clear it's in other countries as well, is this huge disparity about wealth and power. And so here I was working at a bank that one one needed $10 million liquid assets to become a client of the bank. And in the evenings, I was teaching at NYU. 
and a very prestigious university. I was teaching a graduate school for international relations. Uh, but so uh, I left Brown Brothers and I joined a small boutique that focused on helping small and medium sized businesses. And I stopped teaching, uh, this is before COVID, at NYU and I began teaching at a community college. Oh, nice. And uh, so I've been, I've been at Bannockburn now for a bit more than five, almost five and a half years, helping small, medium-sized businesses to navigate the global capital markets. It's sort of like watching a poker game on TV. And you see that the, uh, uh, the person who's got the, what they call a small stack, the yeah. least amount of money on the table, is at a disadvantage. And that, I think, is the story of small investors, retail investors, uh, small businesses that often get treated like tourists in parts of the capital markets. So you, you said just before there's a disparity. The reason that you uh, went to Bannockburn was that that disparity between wealth and power, which, you know, my, I'm seeing more and more of this is that the numbers that, you know, you can get a seat at the table, as you said before, if you've got $10 million, but if you're a small retail investor, you don't get the information, you don't get the the the, the power play, if you like. Uh, do you see that getting worse? And do you see that, that there's a potential for social unrest as a result of this disparity that's increasing? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think it is increasing. Uh, and, and again, it's not just in the United States. It's not a partisan view, a Democrat, Republican, or yeah. or even like it's like socialist or social democratic or labor or nationalist. It's, I think it's a, it goes across a very, numerous countries, most of the major countries. And I, I think it is getting worse. But I think that uh, first, like in the United States, we have a record number of people who own shares, stock. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, of course, is that it's highly concentrated. Uh, so. Uh, to get like over, say, ten thousand U.S. dollars in stock, maybe you have to go to a family income, average family income of a hundred thousand dollars. And so, I would say that the part of the success, I think, in in the U.S. has been like the uh, the admin or the advent of this equity culture. Because remember what happened for 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 our parents' generation, and maybe for some of us who are a bit older, there would be a, a pension. Companies in the U.S. Yep. Uh, especially would give people a pension it would be they would know how much money they have every month after they retire yeah. and it, it, it would be like a defined benefit program and now since the early 80s so we were well into it uh, in the u.s we get uh, the employer if we're lucky makes a contribution to our 401k which is our retirement savings account but we as uh, individuals have to manage that and by managing i mean knowing what mutual fund to buy Mm. But what asset you can have access to that you can buy, they usually give you like a, think of it as like a menu and you just pick and choose without much education and without really much help uh, to do these things. So I, I, I'm afraid that as we move into this, uh, as other countries also adopt this equity culture and it catches more and more and grows, I think a lot of retail, small people, small investors are at a disadvantage. Why? What? Because why are they at a disadvantage? Because they they just don't have the wealth to have the, the 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 seat at the table. Is that what you're saying? I think partly the wealth, but it's also even if they even if they have the money, but they don't have the know what to do with it. And right. by that I mean sort of analytic skills, knowing about uh, uh, what what does it mean to diversify a portfolio. What is like yeah. these are like. Uh, Things that people go to graduate school or get a PhD to really understand and figure out. And yet we put the burden of one's retirement back on the individual. And yeah. uh, so it requires not it requires not just money, uh, like the small stack at the table, but it also requires understanding what to do with that information when you have it. OK, we're going to get into to that a little bit more because I'd love to, to hear your views on, on that. But before we do, I want if we could mark your view currently, the, the macro view on the economy, global economy, because you do look at the global capital markets. Where are we right now? Because where we sit here in Australia, it seems to be a little bit confusing. There's lots of talk about um, that markets are soft. Oh, no, markets are strong. Equities are good. No, 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 go, go to gold. No, 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 go to cash, sit on the side. Holy Hector, there's so many conversations out there. Yeah, I, I think it, it sort of adds to like this noise that we hear. Yeah. We don't we don't like listen to a radio. Like this noise and there's a signal, and reasonable people might differ. Uh, what my what my son thinks is music, the signal sometimes I think is noise, and so. <laughs> 
people, right? Reasonable people can differ about these things, but in a big picture, I think, and here's where we are, and globally speaking, I mean, so talking about like the G20 countries, G10 countries, um, the, so the largest economies in the world, Australia would be among them, of course. I think that uh, what happened is that we were hit with this, I think of it like a snake eating a doe. And you can sort of see the dough work its way through the snake's body. Well, we're the snake. And the dough is these, these shocks that we've been hit with. Not just COVID, the pandemic, but then how countries dealt with it, varying in degrees, when they ended it, when they were reopened, uh, how accessible they were to international at, right away. Uh, and then, uh, so at, we're, just, we're just like uh, uh, getting through COVID and the aftershocks and then Russia invades Ukraine and another disruption takes place. And then uh, while this is all going on, you've got this rivalry between the U.S. and China, where it's not just a rivalry where like uh, going to show our citizens live longer or better or something like that. But it's it's trade rivalry, which involves protectionism, uh, what they call de-risking, moving production out of China to places that are we think of it as friend shoring or near shoring. And so, uh, uh, so we had this, we had these shocks. Governments responded, central banks responded, and now we're sort of dealing with the aftermath. That little boom that they created uh, after COVID or through COVID uh, has come to an end. Central banks raised interest rates to slow down inflation to again varying degrees and now we're about to begin uh sometime i think uh, probably maybe around the middle of the year the market thinks could be as early as q1 end of q1 and that the central banks begin easing rates uh that inflation has fallen some of the supply shocks have worn off the supp- some of the supply chains have reopened and this is allowing inflation to fall and allowing central banks to cut interest rates as economies weaken What role do you think central banks do play and also what role do you think central banks should play in the markets at the moment? Because there's, they're they're playing a lot. They're digging, they're digging deep and they're, they're, they're playing with the markets and not necessarily to the good of all. Yeah. You know, every so often we get this pushback, including in the United States about the role of central banks, uh, and America has had a very, like to say, spotty history. And it's history having central banks, ending them, having them come again. And our, this latest form is Federal Reserve. And you're right that from the great financial crisis uh, through uh, the pandemic till now, uh, central banks have taken on a greater uh, power, greater influence, mm-hmm. uh, partly because I think that the uh, sort of, I want to say that the situation sort of required some bold action in addition to uh, what the what f- f- what the central governments were doing. And here's partly why: and when inflation uh, became deflation, so instead of prices rising, prices are falling. They go into negative territory. The return on capital, go, I mean, you think about what happened at its peak. We had something like $17 trillion of negative yielding bonds. It's mind-boggling to negative interest rates. And even to this day, as we talk here today, Japan is the last of the major countries whose central bank is targeting an overnight interest rate of negative, wow. of minus 10 basis points. And so we, we haven't dealt with this kind of like a world like before, negative nominal, negative real interest rates and real interest rates, right, are the nominal interest rate, the rate, you, the interest rate you see minus inflation to get what the economists call a real rate. So we're familiar with negative real rates where the interest rate is lower than the rate of inflation. Yeah. But negative nominal rates, the most I could, the, the closest I could come to thinking about what it could mean is I went to the bank the other day and I, I took out cash, but it wasn't my right. bank. And they charged me $2 to take out $100. In effect, they charged me 2% to get my $100. It's insane. Don't even get me started. Like, Mark, we could do a whole interview on this one because people just, they accept it though, because you don't have a choice. Yeah, I think that that's part of the challenge that we have. And it's not, again, it's not just in the United States. It's, I think, the way capitalism has evolved. And various countries I know have different antitrust legislation and different antitrust rules. But we're long past this era of like this capitalism. We have a bunch of small companies and they're all price, uh, price the takers. Instead, I think we live in a where, I mean, even think about it for like Pepsi, Coke, uh, uh, OIS, and Android. 
uh, two major operating systems. I, I think that that's part of the challenge that we have early, you know, early in the, you know, where we are in the sort of the evolution of things uh, that capital. So, I mean, we're talking about companies that could be worth a trillion dollars. Yeah. And I'm not saying, I don't know what level is bigger. I mean, it's all like, it's all contextual, of course. I'm just saying that the kind of world that we live in now is a lot different than we might think we do and might a lot different than we thought we had when we were growing up. And I'll give you an example. And this is one of the reasons I love the foreign exchange market. It's the biggest of the capital markets. It's the deepest. Every day, now the Bank for International Settlements does a survey. They, they were a bank that was created to collect war reparations from Germany. Oh, but you yeah. could you could Google it, Bank for International Settlements, BIS.org. And what you'd find is that they do a survey every three years about the size of the foreign exchange market. The average daily turnover is about seven and a half trillion dollars a day. I know it's, it's a mind-boggling number. What this means is put this in perspective for you. The world's GDP, everything the world produces in a year is about a hundred trillion dollars. Wow. We okay. Seven percent of that in a day, or maybe maybe think maybe a better comparison. You think well, foreign exchange is needed for trade. Well, how much is trade in a year? Trade in a year. There's very various estimates, but it's about thirty-five to forty trillion dollars. We'll do that in you know a little bit more than a week in the foreign exchange market. Annual trade covered in in, a, in about a week or so. Global GDP can be bought. In about three weeks, with a turnover in foreign exchange, the capital markets are bigger than the markets for goods or services. Okay, so the the the, the debt just going away slightly. The debt at the U.S. dollar debt at the moment, I think, is about four, thirty-four trillion dollars and growing exponentially. Uh, is that a debt that can, that can continue to be sustained, Mark? And can can we just keep? kicking the can down the road and allowing that debt to, because to me, it feels like, <clears throat> you know, we talked about cash before, it's almost become monopoly money and and, and it's just a number. It doesn't have any true value, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I hear you. I think that a lot of people share this concern that they, they see the debt levels rising. And again, not just in the United States. And the United States is roughly, uh, so call it a little bit more than 100% debt to GDP. Uh, Japan is over 200% debt to GDP. Uh, Euro many European countries are close to 100% of GDP, leaving aside like the obvious Italy or something like that. So I, I think that people are concerned about the debt and partly because they don't see the end game. How does yeah. this, how, how does this, and I wonder if we, a couple of things. One I'd say is, uh, uh, well, I guess if the first thing to say is that if if they really were, if people thought that we were at the edge of a crisis that it was unsustainable, I think we we know we know we know what we kind of behavior we'd expect to see, and we'd expect to see people selling their, their government bonds, not just U.S. government bonds, but Italian government bonds, Japanese government bonds. They'd be selling the world's bonds because of this this uh, this like. Uh, huge debt problem with no 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 clear resolution no clear political will to really address it and yet we're sitting here with the bond markets having just rallied uh roughly the u.s 10 year down 100 basis points in a couple of months and so i'd say that uh it's one of those things i, I think a lot of you know changes i think can be like two big categories of changes bumps and grinds a bump is like uh, a big thing that happens, uh, Russia invading Ukraine, uh, Ham the Hamas and Israel conflict, 9-11 um, in the United States. Uh, these were these were bumps. These were like breaks from the past. But I think that the debt issue is more like population and climate, and that, it's, that it is a change, but it's more of a grind. A little bit every day. It's sort of like how they say you should cook frogs, huh? Not boiling water, but just hot water. Yeah. Then they don't know when they start to boil. It's just it's 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 the slow kill, if you like. But Mark, you know, I I look at my beautiful audience out there, and <clears throat> you've got a very strong background in economic analysis uh, to to those financial institutions you spoke about. But what advice? And I know, look, this by the way, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot take this as your own financial advice. We don't know your individual circumstances. But what I'm asking from Mark is, you know. What do individuals do to translate these complex economic trends into something that they can they can use in a more practical way, if you like, uh, as as people transition and make sure that I guess 
in a way, uh, protecting their wealth or even growing it. Yeah, you know, when it, when it comes to like uh, fixing a car, I think there's some guys that down the down the block that I live that used to be able to fix the internal combustion engine, mm -hmm. and they'd like tinker around. And now it's so computerized; they have to go to the professionals. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when our dishwasher breaks or your refrigerator breaks, uh, we're happy to go. We need plumbing work. We need carpentry work. We're happy to hire out experts. But it comes to money. Somehow, I think that we as people uh, still put money on like a pedestal and we're embarrassed to ask for help. Uh, we don't know how to find the help. But there's a whole I want to say there's a whole cottage industry that has grown up around trying to help people manage their money. And it's, not, it's been also been, I want to say, democratized, where maybe it used to be you needed a, a, a million dollars to have a, a personal financial advisor. But over time, and as competition has grown in this sector, I think you could one can find uh, f financial planners, financial advisors, and there's a whole certification program for these kind of occupations now. So you could go to someone who's accredited, and I, I think oftentimes reputation is one of those things, you know, where the uh, where reputation matters and it's mattered for a long time, some of these advisory type positions. And so I, I, so I think for, for most people, I'd say, uh, listen, it's, it's, you've got a lot on the line. Even people like myself uh, who have been involved in the markets and who have some understanding of the way the markets work and some ideas about how to invest and understanding the tools, the different type of stop orders one could leave and that kind of thing. Even I uh, uh, have a financial advisor, a financial planner. It's a lot of personal responsibility. And my job for a living is I try to help small and medium-sized businesses navigate not the stock market, not their pension money, but navigate, which partly means hedging, like right. insurance their currency risk, their interest rate risk, their commodity risk. So when it comes to managing a portfolio, I might know, I might have some idea about the way economics and the markets work, but I am not, I'm not an expert in that. And so I, I also seek advice from people who I think are credited and who have, who've been like told to me from other people, sort of word of mouth. Who right. can I talk to? I, I just inherited some money or I'm thinking about retiring yeah. or or how much should I be taking out for my for my pension plan? How should I manage these taxes? And so I, I think uh, seek advice. Yeah. And and the way it works too is you know these days it used to be when I first got involved in the markets for small investors they'd have to pay an eighth of a point, twelve and a half cents more when they bought stock. If they didn't buy a hundred shares at a time, and and businesses have a lot of brokerage houses have done away with that. Now they won't charge any commission. Yeah. But. But you have like a wrap fee for the amount of money you have under management or how much money you have in your account there. They charge you a flat fee, almost the way a mutual fund would charge, something on the magnitude of, say, one and a half to two percent. Right. So you are being charged uh, for some of these things. But th that also is it what other people have done. And this is why we've seen in the industry moving away from actively managed accounts, say from a mutual fund to an ETF. Uh, exchange yes. traded for an index because yes. people say a lot of those equity fund managers and it doesn't matter what house you know you can think of all the names of the big large mutual fund equity managers they typically do not beat their benchmark they can on occasion but not for the long run very few of them can fixed income is a slightly different story they're the fund manager for various reasons can typically beat their benchmark but it's still a benchmark and so People have moved into these passive investments like these ETFs because they say the active person can, isn't doing a great job. They can't beat the market. Why don't I just put my money in index funds? And that's what a lot of people have done to bypass the whole issue. But that sort of begs the question. If I have relatives, of course, who don't who aren't who don't aren't involved in the markets in any way. And if I told them, oh, just put your money in an S&P index fund, they wouldn't have a clue what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned ETFs as I speak to you this week, uh, the Bitcoin ETF. Now, I don't know whether you were even looking at this, uh, Mark, because some people like Peter Schiff are like, Bitcoin is a complete con. It's going to zero. Who cares? Well, someone cares because the Bitcoin ETF allegedly is coming out this week. And I'm sure by the time I publish this, it's probably out. There's a lot of there's going to be a lot of assets under management with this Bitcoin ETF. Are you looking at that at all? Does that can is that even on your radar or don't care? 
I look at it, uh, of course, and I had to, uh, I'm a type of person, maybe it's like doubting Thomas stigmata. I wanted to learn about it, a little bit about the crypto space. Uh, and I traded a little bit, try to experiment a little bit. Here's what a wallet is. Here's what a cold storage is. Here's how the markets work. Uh, here's how the stable coins work. So I've dabbled a little bit. Uh, I think it's, to me, uh, it's interesting, but it hasn't really proven like a use case. And that is what, what are we going to use it for? And I know, you know, economists have this uh, pretty specific definition of money. It's got to be used as a unit of exchange. It's a store of value and it's a unit of account. And I think about what Bitcoin does. And I, I read an article in Barron's uh, back when uh, uh, Musk at, was saying he was going to sell his Teslas for Bitcoin. And I sort of asked rhetorically, how many would he sell in Bitcoin? And I said, I basically was implying it would be a very low number because who would have the Bitcoin uh, to, to pay him? And then remember there's this uh, urban legend about a person who, uh, when Bitcoins oh, were first launched. The, the two pizzas. The pizza or something. Yeah, the pizzas, right? And so yeah. nobody wants to be that person. And so I thought, and also, I mean, I talked to a lot to corporate treasurers. And the job of a corporate treasurer when it comes to foreign exchange is to manage their risk. Yeah. which is to reduce the risk. And yet uh, we would think that a corporate treasurer would take on a new currency that he doesn't have revenue in, that he doesn't have any liabilities in. It's not like he's going to pay his workers in Bitcoin. It's not like he can pay his suppliers in Bitcoin. It's not like Maybe he can he pay will. his Bitcoins. Maybe down the road, but that's not like it's not going to happen today or tomorrow. And I kind of think there's a contradiction at the very heart of crypto as a coin, as a currency. If you think that, so you have two currencies, you have the dollar, you have crypto. And you say, well, the dollar is being is being undermined. It's being uh, debased by the central banker who keeps printing it. And so the rule then is that you'd use the coin that's being debased. You use that for your expenditures and you hoard the valuable coin. Uh, there's a law for this in economics, Gershom's Law. It's called, it basically says that bad money chases out the good. The bad money, in this case, fiat, chases out the good, crypto, which people will hoard because that's going to be the real source of value. The problem is, the more we hoard the crypto, that is, we don't use it for transactions. It doesn't develop a networking effect to count as money. My mm -hmm. land, crypto, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, maybe Bitcoin is used to pay rents, to pay grocers, but not today. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to have to pay my, and I have a, some comic books with Clark Kent, not, not Superman, but Clark Kent proposed the lowest lane. Those comic book prices have appreciated 20, 30, 30%, 30 times in value. Wow. And yet I can't use them to pay my grocer. Sure. I can't use them to pay my landlord. And so money has a specific function. And I think that's interesting. There seems to be a lot of, uh, there seems to be crypto has emerged as an asset of some kind. But the use case of it still eludes me, especially for uh, high income, uh, w fairly wealthy countries like Australia, the United States or Western Europe. Do we really do we need that? And you say, well, it digitalizes things. And yeah, I hear that about the digitalization. You know, that seven and a half trillion dollars a day in the foreign exchange market. That's mostly digitalized. It's not yeah. like these corporations are bringing bags of dollars to a, a commercial bank and saying, sell these dollars for me and give me my give me my euro notes and coins. It's all digitalized already. Yeah. Uh, maybe there's a maybe there's something to be said for blockchain. Uh, I don't know. I mean, we've had a shared ledgers for a long time. Uh, so I'm not sure, but I, I but I am following it. I think that it's going to be like the uh, it's a bit, it'll be a big hit. Uh, to me, the question is uh, whether a lot of this has already been priced into uh, the Bitcoin. I mean, we're near fifty thousand dollars. We're we're approaching fifty thousand dollars for Bitcoin, and isn't isn't some of the rally in anticipation? Yes, of course. And, so, and, and, you know, that's a really important thing, really, is that the, is in most of our lives, we think about cause taking place before effect. Yes. And yet in the financial markets, what the, what the financial markets are great about is anticipating, discounting future scenarios. So sometimes you sort of see this happen. Uh, people are saying, oh, we expect strong earnings for a particular company. Their earnings come out strong. And I say, oh, strong earnings, I should buy the stock. Meanwhile, the people who bought the stock in anticipation of the strong earnings sell it to me. And they take their profits and give me like uh, sort of the, the leftovers. Yeah, yeah.
Well, speaking speaking of leftovers and what's going on uh, globally, we, you spoke before about you know war in Ukraine and also the 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 war with between Palestine and Israel. Is that going to be a disruption to the markets, to the currencies as well globally, or you know is that going to be expansive? Is that a distraction, or or could it have quite a big impact uh, on on global currency markets? Well, it's interesting. I think that sometimes there are really important things uh, that are important, not just for an economic sense, but bigger, important significance that don't matter in the currency markets. <laughs> in right. a sense that not, not everything can be reduced to uh, dollars and cents uh, uh, quantified. I do think that uh, uh, that the war in Ukraine has been a big shock for Europe. And this has they're just getting out of COVID, but you can see this in the, sh the terms of trade shock. I'll give you an example: is that uh, Europe is still, despite having a, a fairly mild winter, and we're about halfway through it for Europe, for European standards, and for European gas consumption. And it's been a pretty mild winter, the second mild winter in a row, and yet Europe is paying uh, more than twice what the U.S. does for energy, for gas. And so it puts them in a less competitive position, which is why in 2023, uh, the US, part of the reason why the U.S. economy was able to grow while Europe pretty much stagnated. The U.S. dollar, um, I, I remember, Mark, back in, I think it was 2011, uh, it was on parity with the Aussie dollar. Um, yeah. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> Aussie dollar, I think, is about 65 cents to, to the U.S. dollar. Um, Stronger for longer, US dollar doesn't seem to be having any dips in the, along the road at the moment. What's your outlook for US dollar going forward? Yeah, so I had, uh, I'm, I'm in the camp that sort of thinks uh, big picture, something like this. The, the uh, One of the great things about the foreign exchange market is the markets, they trend five or sometimes 10 years. Unlike, say, stocks, which are tied to the business cycle, and you have to have a new idea pretty often. Uh, thank God. And the currency markets, you don't need a new idea very often. And the U.S. dollar has been in a sort of rally more or less since the end of the great financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And, of course, there's hiccups along the way. It's not a straight line. Uh, but I think that that big dollar rally is is over. And well, I think it's the over is be, really behind us. And that is to say that I think uh, if you can recall back in uh, September, or uh, October 2022, uh, uh, Liz Truss was the Prime Minister of the UK, uh, mm -hmm. sparked a big controversy there. Sterling fell to record lows, about a dollar three. The Aussie was also sold amid this huge uh, sell off in foreign currencies and a rally in the US dollar. And I think that marks the low, sort of the low point. Uh, I think we retested that uh, for the Australian dollar uh, last year or so. Uh, but I think that the, the US dollar, big dollar rally is over. Over and I think we work our way lower, partly on the back. And it's not so much that there's good news right now from Europe or Japan mm -hmm. or China. Uh, but what's happening is that uh, a new convergence is taking place, if you will. So first it was divergence, the U.S. outperforming, just because the Federal Reserve and our central government, our federal government, have been so aggressive in their policy responses that it really stimulated the economy. And almost, I mean, but and even before COVID struck, remember the U.S. was running about a 5% budget deficit mm -hmm. at good times in uh, 19, roughly uh, 2017, 2018, 2019, with the tax cuts we got under President Trump. And despite having a fairly strong economy at the time. So the U.S. Uh, has outperformed. And now I, and that's helped fuel the dollars rally. And now I think that the U.S. reconverges with Europe and Japan and slows down dramatically. Whether we go to whether recession this year or next year, I don't know. I mean, I, I do think we just slow down below the speed limit. And the speed limit is the, the level of growth that the Fed says uh, is not inflationary, which is about 1.7% in the U.S. Right. Uh, so do you see, uh, interest, you, you mentioned this before, interest rates potentially coming down in 24? Certainly there's talk of that in Australia. Uh, we've had 13 interest rate hikes in a row. Uh, our next uh, Federal Reserve, the Reserve Board meets in February. They don't have a meeting in January. Uh, but there is talk later this year that interest rates will be uh, coming down. What's uh, what's Mark Chandler's view on interest rates? Because that affects a lot of people. It affects people 
who are purchasing property. It affects people who have got loans, et cetera, et cetera. It affects savers in a good way. But what's your view? Yeah, so in some ways, uh, it's, it's always awkward to talk about uh, a country that I've never visited. I only like read about <laughs> We'll have numbers. to get you out here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Australia, I think, uh, per is perceived to have been a bit slow uh, to raise interest rates. Uh, for example, the uh, policy rates at about 4.35%. Uh, look at New Zealand. They're above 5%. The U.S. is above 5%. Europe's above, uh, Europe is close to 5%. Uh, so Australia uh, hiked rates uh, began later in the cycle, hiked rates a bit less. And now that uh, things are slowing down, inflation slowing down, the economy looks to be slowing down, that Australia seemed not to be cutting rates as aggressively as other countries. So, for example, while the market's looking for the Fed, the Bank of England, uh, the ECB to cut rates 125 basis points or so over the next 12 months, the market has about 50 basis points of cuts from the RBA. So, again, it's the idea that uh, a little bit slower to raise interest rates. So, and not as much. Inflation has been a little bit sticky. And so, as other countries, see a bigger fall in inflation, they have more latitude to cut interest rates. But uh, what this might result in, though, is as the U.S. interest rates fall faster than Australia, that could give the Australian dollar a bit more of a lift. Meaning, and how that would affect a lot of Australia, I think, is when you go over, when you go someplace to travel, the Aussies a little bit, it can buy you a better hotel room. Yeah. Hundred um, percent. All right. So, do you 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 spoke about Japan? You've spoken about bonds. We've spoken about the U.S. dollar. You think that it's peaked and it's coming off, uh, going into twenty twenty four. What other trends are you seeing at the moment, Mark? Globally. Yeah, you know, it's funny what you said about the uh, about uh, not watching Netflix. I think one of the interesting memes, if you will, through a lot of this uh, pop culture is a sort of a, a, an interesting position that Australia finds itself in. Uh, obviously tied to uh, global capital markets, uh, defensively tied with the U.S., the U.K., with the, uh, with the submarine, uh, increasingly, uh, I think, cooperating with other countries uh, like uh, Japan, uh, South Korea, uh, uh, Philippines. And, uh, and yet the trade ties are so overwhelmingly to, to, uh, to China, China and Australian trade ties. I want to say that China-Australia trade ties, uh, the trade flows are bigger than the next three Australian trading partners put together. Yeah. And so one of the common like uh, memes in these uh, in these uh, Netflix-like shows are these dramas, of course, with this, with this seemingly contradiction between security interests and economic interests uh, reach some kind of a breaking point. So I, I think it's uh, interesting that, you know, uh, of course, one of the things that mark uh, this period of time, besides these uh, the rise of populism or uh, uh, volatility in the capital markets, or like you were saying before, this seemingly wholesale encroachment into the markets by central bankers and maybe central, you know, federal governments. But in addition to that, we've got this rise of China that's, uh, you know, many, many economists talk about it. Chinese economic model is not good anymore. It's failed. Uh, Chinese economy looks like it grew about 5% last year in 2023. It's likely to grow another 5% this year or something around there. If you believe their numbers, I believe the World Bank IMF estimates and these kinds of things. Uh, uh, the U.S. has tried stopping China from developing some uh, latest technology with chips. Uh, my guess is it's not going to work. Uh that uh, that we have that this is the challenge I think of our time is uh, how to, how can we make room at the economic table for China and especially given its differences a different value system different ways of uh, operating than say the U S and and Australia and Western Europe how do we make room for that I mean you know when our grandparents tried making room for the United States and Germany, rising powers in the early part of the say late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, it didn't end very well. And hopefully our generation, we can, we can think this thing through, the, through um, more thoroughly and recognize the dangers of not making room. People talk about, well, 
if we only kept China out of the WTO, really, that would have been the solution. Uh, I think that would have created a uh, fragmented the global economy earlier uh, than maybe it's doing now, and in a way that we have less influence and control over. So there's not a good, de- there's no good decisions here. There's just a lot of difficult and hard decisions. There's going to be trade offs for us, but I think that we have to get our heads around it. And for me, partly what it means is that everything that China does, we can't complain about. And yet there does seem to be this, what I think is this war, this, this sort of steady uh, drumbeat of war. We, I think that in order for us to recognize China as an enemy, the elite, I have to like encourage people to think of China as dangerous and as trying to harm us. And, it, and there might be an element of truth to that. Uh, but at the same time, we're trying to do the same thing. But also we have to think about a way to avoid, I think, uh, a, conf- a, a military confrontation. And I, I, partly because I think a military confrontation, we, it, yeah, there's a lot of risks associated with it and how much it can be contained. All right, we're running out of time, uh, Mark, but I do want to come up uh, and ask you this question about the BRICS. Uh, you speak about China. Uh, we've got Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa in the BRICS nations and more and more countries joining it. Does that change the global market scene at all, given what you've just spoken about with China? Yeah, I really don't think so. Partly because I don't think the BRICS really, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a club. I can't yeah, they've got their act together. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, that's the thing. And, and, and there's good reason why they're not going to be able to get their act together. Think about what's happening. First, India and China have unresolved border disputes. Secondly, they both rival each other for regional hegemony, who can control the Indian Ocean. Thirdly, think about what's happening just between uh, Russia and India. R- R- Russia supplies India with weapons that India uses to help defend themselves against the Chinese. Oh, but India also that. buys India also buys oil from Russia, and so uh, there was an agreement. Well, let's use our own currency. Let's stop using the dollar. Well, great idea, right? Sounds good. India pays Russia rupee. Russia says, "What are we going to do with the rupee? We don't want the rupee anymore." So lately, what India has been doing is paying them with UAE Durham. So the UAE's currency called the Durham, it's tied to the dollar. So India, uh, because India doesn't want to pay with Chinese RMB, that would help their rival. So I think that the reason that I'm I'm skeptical about BRICS is that one is what do they have in common? What are they going to do together? And I think that the bigger it gets, and this is what we see with the EU, the bigger it gets, it's harder to find a consensus. Yeah. And secondly, I think that if, if should they have their own currency? And I think who wants them to have their own currency? China wants to use the RMB. Russia they wants also to want to use. Money. Sorry to interrupt you, Mark. Aren't they also talking about using gold? Yeah, but gold is sort of impractical still. I like that. I mean, theoretically, uh, it sounds good, but I I don't think that. Uh, I, I mean, and this is why I, I point out before about the role of the capital markets relative to the markets for goods. Goods it would be gold. Gold would count as that. And the capital markets, the, the reason the dollar is the, has a role that the dollar has isn't because, because uh, Saudi Arabia sells oil in U.S. dollars. It's part marginally helpful. We call that transactional demand. Yeah. But the real reason is that think of, you're in Japan, you want to retire. You, you, you want to buy government bonds in Japan. The government bond yields about 70 basis points, 70 basis points a year. So what do pension funds around the world do? They buy U.S. treasuries. Mm-hmm. Safe, secure asset. There's yes. nothing like it for the BRICS. There's nothing like that really for China. A lot of Chinese bonds are local government debt, not federal debt. And so I just don't, I, I think that to really challenge the dollar means to challenge the role of the U.S. Treasury market. And I don't think anybody is really up to the task right now. So sum it all up for us, Mark, uh, where you think we are at the moment. Is that uh, uh, you, you actually said that the U.S. dollar has peaked, but then you, you kind of contradicted that by saying it's still very much in demand. Oh, yeah. So I would put it like sort of like this. There's the uh, there's a day to day fluctuations of the dollar. How many, you know, how many, how many, how much euro, how many, how much of a dollar the euro could buy or Japanese yen or Chinese RMB. And in that kind of way, I think that the price of the dollar is going to fall. 
But in terms of the dollar's role in the world economy, the world economy that we've come used to, uh, dollar-based uh, mobility of capital, I think that world continues and the dollar still is the key part of that. Even China, you know, China's had two big initiatives, uh, the Belt Road Initiative mm -hmm. and the uh, Asian uh, uh, Infrastructure Invest Inve Infrastructure Investment Bank (AIIB), and both of those two, Belt Road Initiative and the AIIB, are basically still you, you still pay for dollars. The BRI, the Chinese lend dollars to the people who the countries in which they're building the infrastructure project for. The AIIB takes dollars as the and, you know, to make a subscription to these like multilateral institutions, countries put up money. That money is put up in dollars. Most of that BRIC, the BRICS have a bank, the New Development Bank. Most of its loans are in dollars. Yeah. And so, so for me, it's not so much a contradiction. I think it's important to keep the two functions in, uh, separate, though. One is the price, and one is the role. And so, the role I think is still unrivaled, but the price could decline. Price could decline, but the role of the US dollar is going to be around for quite some time. Mark Chandler, it's been absolutely fascinating to have a chat with you. And uh, you, uh, in that background, there's New York City, Manhattan, a place, ladies and gentlemen, that I lived in back in the 80s, and it was pretty crazy back then. Uh, how is it over there now, Mark? I still as crazy as you'd imagine. Yeah, but go on. I just said, you know, like big cities, I think that uh, our species are urban based. And I think that's big change. To, you know, the, uh, maybe the uh, beginning of uh, the 2000s was when a majority of humans now we live in cities yeah. uh, out of the world. Now, there's some countries, of course, Africa, parts of India, uh, exceptions. But for the most part, we're an urban based species. We're an urban based species with a lot of things going on around the world at the moment. A lot of challenges are going forward. Uh, and in the US, of course, they have an election year coming up. And perhaps I'll get Mark to come back on when we get close to the election and see what's happening with that US dollar and also with the economy in the US. But for now, Mark Chandler, people can go and, and, and find you at Mark, Mark, uh, what is it? Marktomarket.com. Can they find you on Twitter as well? I'm on Twitter. My handle there comes from the title of my first book. Uh, so my Twitter handle is Mark Making Sense. Mark Making Sense. The title of the first book was Making Sense of the Dollar. Uh, yeah. I joined Twitter around then. So Mark Making Sense and that blog, as you mentioned, uh, marktomarket.com. And how can they find your books? Can they find that on marktomarket.com? Sure. Uh, they're like they're, they're available. You're probably your favorite uh, bookstore. You get a hard copies of books, uh, but you can go to the blog and it, it'll, it'll give you links to them. Uh, check them out. Uh, I'd love people to, as, as I said, right at the start of the conversation, his first book was called Making Sense of the Dollar back in 2009, still relevant today. And his second book was The Political Economy of Tomorrow, published in 2017. As I always say to you, ladies and gentlemen out there, Make sure you, as part of your daily routine, you should be reading and not just watching people like us. Thanks for joining me so much on Making Money Matter, Mark. Thank you. Good luck to everybody.